Hello and welcome back to the bare metal programming series where we're building firmware for a Cortex M4 STM32 microcontroller. This is episode six of the series and it's kind of the second episode in our communications portion of the series where in the previous episode we got a very basic UART driver written which allows the firmware uh, through a nice API to speak over the UART protocol to the computer. And in the middle between the computer and the microcontroller, we have a USB to UART converter, which are ubiquitous and easily found on Amazon or AliExpress or anywhere where you can get your cheap gadgets. Um, but the implementation that we came up with had a couple of problems. Um, so let's take a little look at the code from last time, just as a brief refresher and use that as kind of the guiding principle of as to what we're actually going to solve today. So if I open up the shared UART.C, uh, this is the interface we came up with. Just over 60 lines of code, um, nothing too crazy, but also with some, some very clear issues. Now, the first issue, which is quite easily solvable, is that we have a data buffer which consists of a single byte. And the problem with that, of course, is that we receive data in our interrupt handler and we stuff the data that we receive into this data buffer and then it has to be read by the firmware in order to for the firmware to do something with it. So we see that manifest in the app firmware.c file. So here kind of we've got the part of the code that deals with PWM. And here we have a little chunk of code now that's dealing with UART. And we check if there's any data available. And if there is, we kind of read the byte out and we, we actually write back to the UART a little bit of information that's just a transformation on the data that we got. So quite straightforward stuff here. The problem is you can imagine that, of course, this is kind of a unit of work that we're doing. This is a unit of work as you can imagine that uh, we have a lot more work to do in the firmware, right? We actually, you know, in an actual embedded device, you want to do a lot more kind of interesting stuff than simply uh, changing the brightness of an LED, right? You might have um, a some kind of motor controller that you're dealing with. And so you're managing all of the things related to that. You have to read some sensors. You have to see what's going on right back to them. Maybe you're also updating a graphical display. So you have a little routine that's uh, setting that up. And maybe you have some state machines running that deal with some other kinds of logic. So kind of what you have is a bunch of different things going on in the firmware, each of which needs a little slice of time to, to take place. And the ideal situation uh, is that you have a good understanding about how long the timing is of all of the individual parts and in kind of the worst case. So what you can do is you can say, well, I know that this should take this long and this long. And that will give you a sense of if you have enough time to basically, you know, by the time all of this stuff is done, when I get to actually reading from the UART, am I sure that it isn't possible that another byte came in between? Because of course, the second that a new byte comes in, it's going to replace the first byte. So that's our first problem. We kind of need to buffer the data better. We need to have more buffer. And we need to kind of think of a strategy for um, like how much buffer do we need? Can we can we be a little bit more? Um, it, do we just pull a number out of the air or can we can we kind of think about that a bit? Um, the second big problem and arguably a worse problem than what we have now is we're using this data available variable. <clears throat> so this is kind of a local variable to this module. And the way that we actually set this up is that um, when data comes in, we know that there is some data available, so we set this to true. And then further down, um, we have this UART read function, uh, which is kind of the core function of, uh, of the, the read. We have a convenience function as well, but we'll disregard that for now. So in this one, we, we also set that variable to false when we've kind of read any data out. But you can see the problem here, right? We don't know when the interrupt service routine will run. And if we happen to be executing this line, for instance, or we just, we've just finished executing this line, we're about to do this, 
when all of a sudden we get another interrupt with data and that data gets stuffed into our buffer and we say that data is available. And then as soon as we return from that interrupt, we end up here and we set data available to false uh, because we think we don't have any data anymore. And all of a sudden we've lost the byte. And that kind of issue is extremely hard to debug. It's extremely hard to even observe, but to debug it and kind of zoom in on that bug, that's, that's a tricky one. So we kind of need to solve this problem that's kind of our biggest issue, actually. The, the having more buffer space, ah, it's kind of easily solved. And even, um, even kind of just figuring out how much buffer space do we need, well, you can often get by just through tri trial and error. You can kind of do a, almost like a binary search into your best kind of, uh, <laughs> your best, uh, best needed amount of space, right? You could just set it high. Okay, it succeeds, cut it in half. Oh wait, we failed there, so I need to go a little bit higher. And you can slowly zoom your way into kind of what is the perfect amount of buffer if you have a way to kind of tweak your um, your your variables and kind of force things to take longer than, than you think they will. So that's that's possibility without even analyzing the timing. Uh, but the, the race condition here, that's that's a trickier one. All right, so let's look at the plan for today. We're going to be building something called a ring buffer. Uh, and a ring buffer is going to be the answer to both of these problems. It's going, to, it's going to solve both of these issues. And what our job to do today is really to understand the ring buffer as a data structure, uh, the functions that manipulate that data structure, and how um, they kind of will solve our race condition issues. Um, because it's quite elegant how these issues just go away by using the data structure and, and making sure that we adhere to its uh, its kind of invariant principles. Okay, so um, let's first just kind of, um, let's, let's put a motivating, a motivating example down for like how we can at least solve the, the buffering problem because that one um, is really, really easy to observe. So uh, first what I wanna do is just to go into the system header and write a new function, um, which is going to be system delay. I think we had something very similar to this in one of the early episodes, but this one's going to take in a number of milliseconds and we're going to, we're going to wait for that number of milliseconds. And when I say wait, I mean just like pause the whole program while we're sitting in a loop until this number of milliseconds has passed. It's a very, very inefficient way of delaying, uh, but it's a good way of, forcing this situation that we're trying to observe. So let's implement this function. It's quite straightforward. So we have our ticks up here and we have our uh, get ticks and this is kind of what we will use to interact with this. So what we do is um, <clears throat> we're going to have an, an end time, which is just uh, that wherever we are now, what are the ticks plus the number of milliseconds that we want to wait for. And what we can do is to just have a while loop which checks um, if the current time is still less than the end time. And if it is, then we'll just we'll spin in this loop. And this loop um, will not be optimized. There's no way that the compiler can optimize this away because the ticks variable is volatile. And therefore, even if it thought that we didn't need to do this, it, it still has to leave it in place. So this will wait for a specific number of milliseconds. And what we can do is we can just kind of put that down here as almost as a simulation of a higher workload. So to really, really put this across, let's, um, let's put a, th a one second delay in, which is a huge delay. Um, so yeah, even 100 milliseconds would be good enough, but this will, will really highlight the issue. So let's just, um, let's run this now. I'm gonna upload this firmware. And let's zip over to the, the terminal, connect to the serial port. And if I press the letter A, we get B back. If I press B, we get C. I have a feeling that this actually isn't, uh, isn't working correctly because I don't have the feeling that it is actually, um, I don't have the feeling that it's really waiting for a second there. So what have I done wrong here? So we've got system delay, milliseconds. Did I implement it correctly? System.c. Well, system.getTicks is less than the end time. 
All right. Yeah, we were basically not waiting any time. So that makes some sense. All right, we go back to the thing and um, we're still connected to the serial port. That connection never went away, uh, even though the firmware was not speaking on the other side. So I'm gonna press A now. Now we see that there is some delay. Okay, so if I press B, as long as I press one key, it's fine, even if there's the delay, <clears throat> because the peripherals interrupt service routine will still run. Um, therefore, we will still place data into the buffer. And then finally, when we get back around to checking if there's any data in the buffer, we can deal with it in that case. But if I press A and B in quick succession here, well, that just worked because we were on the boundary, but I'll try again. I pressed A and B in quick succession, but we only saw C. And the reason is that we wrote A and then we were still busy and we wrote B and then only then did the we get back around to checking if the UART had any bytes available. So here we can see why we need a larger buffer because if under a higher workload, we simply will miss input. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is to <clears throat> uh, introduce the ring buffer structure. So uh, the first question to ask is what is a ring buffer? <laughs> um, it's also sometimes known as a circular buffer and it is kind of by definition what's called a first in, first out data structure. Uh, so it can be used as a kind of queue in this sense. Um, and what that basically means is that if we stuff something in and we ask for something, we're gonna get that first thing back, right? The first thing that we put in is the first thing that we take out, even if there are more items. And the reason it's called a circular buffer or a ring buffer is because conceptually you can think about it as a buffer that kind of comes back on itself when you go off the end. So if you think of memory being sort of horizontal flat thing, you start over here, you get to the end of your buffer, now you come back and you begin writing in the beginning again. Of course, you could join those ends together and you get a nice, uh, a nice ring, a circle. And these are kind of, these are the, the most important parts for us. And I'll, I'll qualify this with some, uh, some diagrams, but we can actually see this data structure as having kind of two distinct interfaces. Uh, we got one kind of interface where we're doing the writing and one interface where we're doing the reading. Um, and that's really important. That's kind of where the magic will happen. So if you think about our program, we also have one side of our program is is writing it's uh, it's producing values and that's the interrupt service routine right so the interrupt service routine when a uart byte comes in it's putting that into the buffer it never reads from the buffer it it doesn't need to consume but we have another part of the code which is the firmware which is calling uart read right and that's the consumer so we have a single producer and a single consumer and this um, single producer, single consumer, combined with the fact that the APIs for reading and writing are kind of going to be two distinct things, right? They're almost, you could draw a line down the middle and say that, you know, these two things are separate. Uh, because of that, that's going to give us certain guarantees about the way that um, we can use this concurrently. So let's take a look at the diagram to just get a sense of this. So let me uh, close some of these windows up here. And let's close that one as well. Okay, so I'm not gonna interact with this diagram here because it's just uh, too annoying to rotate the, the things here, but let's imagine this is our, our buffer for our UR. We've got eight places inside the buffer and we have uh, kind of two pointers, two indexes into our buffer. Let's start them at zero. And let's say this is our kind of starting condition well, our reading buffer is at zero and our writing buffer is at zero. And we know that there's no data in this buffer because we haven't put any in there yet, right? This is the start condition. So what we can immediately say is that whenever the read, the read index and the write index or the read pointer and the write pointer, whenever they're equal, um, whenever they are equal, uh, the buffer is empty. So it's the same situation here, right? Even if we started at one, if the place we want to read from is the next place we're going to write into, well, that kind of means that there's nothing there, right? So let's kind of um, take it back and imagine a situation where uh, 
where some data comes into the UART. So uh, a byte comes into the UART, we're in the interop service routine, and you can imagine that we're going to call a function like ring buffer write. And in that function, we end up stuffing a byte into this memory location. And then we move the write pointer forward. So then later in the code, we come to check like, hey, do we have any data available? And the only thing we need to check is, are these two pointers the same? Are these two indexes the same? And if they're not, that means there's some data available for us. So we can read. We read the value in the place that we point to with the read pointer, and then we move it forward. Um, and now they're pointing at the same place again, so now it's empty. But you can imagine we write, 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 and then we can do a read, still not equal, a read, still not equal, a read. Now they're equal, so there's no more data available. And of course, we can do this in such a way that we write off the end. And of course, then when you write off the end, you wrap back around. And so we can do a read, 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 wrap back around, and now we're equal again. So it's actually conceptually really simple. Um, it's just two pointers, two indexes that we're keeping track of, one for the reading side and one for the writing side, a certain amount of memory. And then we just need to make sure that whenever we kind of go off the end, when we would be pointing at number eight, that actually comes back and goes to index zero. So of course you can do that with a modulo operation or a modulus operation, uh, which is basically when you, uh, when you uh, yeah, when you sort of divide, you get the remainder. So if we were to divide by the number of elements we have, then we would come back around and we would be back at zero. But of course, you can also do this with a bit mask. And it works specifically if your um, number of elements is a power of two. So we have eight items here. And if we were to do a bit mask with, um, like we were to say, take our index, add one, and then mask it, with uh, with the number seven, which is one one one, in uh, in binary, well the number eight is one zero zero. So basically, we would only be keeping the bottom uh, the bottom three bits, and we would end up at zero again. I'll try to show that when we do the code. I, I hope that that's clear in the way that that works because we've been doing masking and stuff in this series already. Um, but yeah, this is kind of how we're going to implement it. So that's um. Let's take a look at, at how this is going to help us, because it might not be immediately obvious like how this actually solves the problems, right? It's clearly a data structure and we can see how it works, but why does it solve the problems? All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is to uh, create a ring buffer .h file. And in here, we're going to define our, our interface common defines .h. We're going to define the interface. So the first thing we need is um, some kind of structure to hold the data. So all the bits of data that we just talked about. So let's define a type definition for a particular struct. And it's going to be our ring buffer t. And the name of the name of the struct and the name of the type of the struct are both the same. So both ring buffer t. Could leave this one out, but I like to leave it in. And um, what we're going to have in here is, first and foremost, we're going to have a, uh, a pointer to a buffer in memory. This is just the place where we have some memory that's allocated for this. So we'll just call this the buffer. And the reason we don't just have a fixed size buffer inside here is because maybe uh, we want to have multiple ring buffer instances and we want one that has uh, eight bytes of memory, one that has 128 bytes of memory, and therefore with the same structure we can we can use the the same data. So this is like kind of a reference to some other buffer that is still related by the to the ring buffer. Okay, next we're going to need a mask, and the mask is going to allow us to perform this bit masking operation, which is our very hot cheap in terms of instructions and doing um, doing com computation it's a very cheap operation for wrapping back around uh, in the to the beginning of the buffer and then we're going to have our two indexes so our read index and our write index and this is all the data that we actually need for the ring buffer so this is the entire structure <clears throat> 
Okay, so now we're going to have some functions that relate to this structure. And I'm going to start all the functions with uh, ring buffer. <clears throat> so we're going to have ring buffer setup. And we, we have setups for all of these peripheral functions and all of the kind of little modules we've made. And in all of those other functions, they all take no arguments. But in this case, we're going to want to, want to initialize a specific ring buffer. So um, we'll be taking a pointer to a ring buffer. <clears throat> And then we need to take in uh, a pointer to a data buffer. <clears throat> and finally, we'll take in a, a size of the buffer so we know how large the buffer is. And that will be how we, we do our initialization of this ring buffer. OK, so next we'll have uh, another function called ring buffer empty. And this is just going to tell us um, if our ring buffer has any data or not. So it's kind of equivalent to our UART data available, but it's kind of inverse. And of course, the reason that it's inverse is because it's very easy to tell if things are, uh, are um, if it's empty, right? We know how to tell if it's empty in a single operation. So that's kind of what we will expose. And in the UART, we can just flip that around and show do we have data, right? So it's just the inverse operation. Um, where is the ring buffer? Yeah. OK, so then we're going to have a ring buffer write. So this is going to be when we write a single buffer into the, um, the a single byte into the buffer. And I realize this should have a bool, right? We need to return true or false here. And we're going to also return true or false for this function. So we're going to take in our ring buffer, and then we're going to just take in a byte. And this byte is going to be written into the ring buffer. And we'll return boolean, which will tell us, was this successful or not? So it's going to be possible for us to say, like, did, was this write successful? Like, And the case that it wouldn't be successful is when the data buffer is full. So if it's actually full, we can't write data into the buffer anymore. And I'll show you how we see if it's full or not. So we're also going to have a read. And this will be the same. So we can try to read. We can only read when the buffer is not empty. Uh, so this will tell us if the read was successful or not. And in this case, we will write the value out through a pointer. So they'll pass us a pointer. And we will um, say, hey, this was successful. Uh, declaration is incompatible. OK, there's just a momentary error. OK, and these are the functions that we need for this uh, structure. So quite straightforward, I think. All right, let's actually take these functions. <clears throat> and I will create a ring buffer C. First thing we can do is include the core slash ring buffer H. And then we're going to implement this interface. OK, so ring buffer setup. So they've passed us a pointer to a ring buffer, and we just need to initialize its values. So the buffer, we set that to buffer. And the, uh, the read index, we'll just start it at 0. The write index. We will just start that at 0, 2. <clears throat> and then the mask, well, assuming, and this is um, an assumption that we have built into our API, is that the size has to be a power of 2. Assuming that the size is a power of 2, then we can say that the mask is just size minus 1. Um, so in the case of uh, if our size of the buffer was 8, we had 8 positions, the mask is going to be 7, which is bit 1, 1, 1 in binary. And this happens any time you have a power of 2. The power of 2 minus 1 is like all of the previous bits set to 1. So that's how we can make this mask. I hope that makes some sense. Um, OK, and that's kind of it. That's it for initialization. So we already know how to tell if the ring buffer is empty, right? We we check if its read index is equal to its write index. That's how we tell if the ring buffer is empty or not. <clears throat>
So how do we write data into the ring buffer? Um, well, I think it's easier to implement the read first, so I'm going to move that up. I think that helps us. I think write is just one step more complicated than read. So what we have to do is we need to we need to do this comparison first of all, right? We need to check is the ring buffer empty, and then we need to um, if the ring buffer is sorry, we need to check if the ring buffer is full. Um, no, sorry, I'm getting myself confused. <laughs> we do need to check if it's empty. If it's empty, then we couldn't do a read. So we would simply uh, return at that point, return false. And then we need to <clears throat> we need to write our data into the, the read index, and we need to move the read index forward by one. And then we return true. Um, but throughout all of this, uh, we're going to... Um, we're going to make sure that our read index doesn't change through the entire uh, cycle of this function. So it shouldn't, but we're going to make sure that it doesn't. So the way that we do that is to take a local copy of the read index. So we take RB read index. And uh, we don't need to do this because we're just going to reference it once, but we can take a local write index as well. And what we can do here <clears throat> is to check if these two things are equal. So if these two things are equal, the buffer is empty and we can't read anything from it, so we'll just return false. Otherwise, uh, the buffer is not empty, so we can actually read something. So what we'll say is that um, we'll dereference this byte and write the value into it, which is uh, the buffer at the local read index. Then we need to move the read index forward. So again, local read index equals local read index plus one masked with our buffer, uh, sorry, our mask. So this basically, if we went off the end, uh, the, the and with our mask will wrap it back around to zero. So that's how that works. Then we need to actually commit this local index back to the, the actual read index. So we're going to write the read index as our local index. And finally, we can return true. So that is the, the read operation. So how does the write operation look? Well, it's kind of similar. It's kind of symmetrical. So let's, <clears throat> let's make local copies of our variables again. Uh, we'll take the write index first. It doesn't actually matter. You need to do two reads in a row. So the reason that, uh, of course, the reason that we take local ind indices here is because if someone else were to call ring buffer read at this moment, well, if they called it, if they, any time, if we were to just use these indices uh, indiscriminately, right? Like I was to use read index here, and then I was again to use local read index here, and then again I use it uh, referenced it here, and then, well, we wouldn't need to do this one. But you can imagine that at any of those moments, the value could change um, if someone else has called this function, right? Anyone else who's dealing with local read index. So this shouldn't happen in an interrupt, but if it did, this is a situation where it would happen in a different place. So in that moment, um, what we do instead is at the beginning, we take a local copy. So our local copy is stable. And um, at the end, maybe one function is reading the same value that we are, right? Because we are uh, using our local copy. And they end up setting the, the actual read index back to their newly computed local copy. And at the end, we do the same, but we end up setting the same value in. So we, d we don't kind of um, end up in a collision in that way. And that's really important. Like the, the, the idea of taking this local copy means that even if there are multiple readers, which is, is uh, something that we don't even need really to account for in this case, but even if there are multiple readers, we're not going to get a collision. So this is pretty, uh, pretty important. So same thing for the write, right? Like we don't expect there to be multiple writers to the UR. Uh, sorry, the, 
we do, like the ring buffer is only for reads, right? It's only for us getting data in. We don't expect multiple places to be pushing data into the UR, right? The UR is a single peripheral and data comes from it and we put it into the, a buffer. We don't ever expect that there would be more than one writer into the situation, but um, the read index could change from under us. Uh, although in the right situation, it wouldn't because we're in an interrupt routine. But just uh, to keep this in mind for other contexts as well, this is why we keep local copies. So we make sure that if the context changes and we begin executing another piece of code that is also interacting with the, the buffer in some way, that we've stabilized our value for the whole time. Okay, so now that we have those uh, two local copies, we already need to compute what the next write index would be. So I'm going to do that. That's really simple. So the, the next write index is just well, it's basically this same situation, but for the right index. So uh, the local right index. And why do we need to check that? Because if if the next index that we write to happens to be the same as the, the, the current read index, and let's maybe do this here. So let's say our read index is at this point and our write index is at this point. If we were to write a value at this point, that's fine, but we would end up um, moving the uh, the right pointer to this point, and then what we've done is we've essentially gotten to the end of our buffer. We uh, and now our buffer, at least in the terms of the mechanics that we've set down, our buffer is empty, right? Because our two pointers are the same again, so we've lost all the data in the buffer. Like we have no sane way of recovering from that. The only thing you can do in this situation is that you need to make your buffer larger because it means that your buffer isn't large enough for you to read values out before you overwrite the end. So this is where you need to think about timing. This situation shouldn't happen, but if it does, you need a strategy at this point to deal with it because if you move the data pointer forward, you've lost all the data. Um, what you could choose to instead do is to simply not move the pointer forward and return at this point. And what you've done then is you've lost the most recent piece of data that you have. Another possible strategy, which is more complicated actually to implement, is that you move both of these pointers forward. But then we're in a situation, um, and then what you've done is you've overwritten the oldest piece of data. But the problem here is that now you have to touch both pointers from one place. And that's something you don't want to do. So to avoid that, we're just going to drop the most recent piece of data. If we find ourselves in this situation, we just won't continue um, because uh, it would result in us losing all the data in the buffer. So it's not a great situation, but um, we need some way of resolving it. And this is the way we're going to resolve it. So if the next write index is the same as the local read index, that's a that's a pity, but we will we'll return, drop the data. Otherwise, it means that we can write the byte into the, uh, the, the current write index, <clears throat> which is just RB buffer at the local write index is equal to the byte that we placed in. Then we need to set the local write index. What doesn't it look like here? Identify by it. yeah, it's just very slow. So then at this point, the right index becomes the next right index and we can return true. Okay, so this is actually um, the full implementation of the, of the ring buffer. Uh, this is all we need to worry about. So it's kind of subtle. These two functions, they're, they're quite simple. But notice that we only ever modify the, the read index or the write index independently. And for us to figure out if we have data or not, we simply compare those two indices. We don't modify them. And the cool thing that's happening here is that um, this means that we won't have our problem with the data available variable, which is causing all of the concurrency issues because we're both trying to modify the same variable to keep state. Now, just as a mental exercise, <laughs> you can try to imagine what would happen if you tried to keep track of, let's say, a, uh, a number of items variable inside this ring buffer, right? 
you'll find that you end up in the same situation as the data available again. So in order to track um, how many items are in your buffer, you need to do some more complex things. So we're not going to go down that road today. This is going to work for us, and uh, I think this works fine. So let's implement this inside our UART. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the core ring buffer. So we bring in this header. And the first thing we're going to want to do is to uh, create a, uh, a ring buffer data structure. So we're going to have a ring buffer T. I'm just going to call it RB for brevity. And then instead of having this data buffer, which is just um, you know a single a single byte, we're going to turn it into an array. And the number of items we're going to have in this array, so our ring buffer size, well, for now, let's set it to 64. And we'll talk about how we can compute something for this uh, shortly. So that becomes uh, an array, and we'll just make sure every element in the array is 0. And we can get rid of this data available variable. We don't need it anymore. So first thing we're going to do in the setup is to just set up the ring buffer. So we'll pass in our reference to the ring buffer, our reference to the buffer, which is just the data buffer, and the number of items, the size, that's our ring buffer size. Remember, this is a power of two, so we can just do this minus one, and we'll end up with a nice bit mask that we can use. And that's done. So now we need to deal with our interrupt service routine. So we've got a byte of data. We need to we need to put it into our ring buffer. So for that, we use a ring buffer write. We pass in our ring buffer stru structure, and we pass in the byte that we have. And the byte that we have is this one. So we receive it from the UART, and then we can get rid of those two calls. And remember, this can fail, right? So um, what we could do is to wrap this up in an if statement and then somehow handle the failure. But it's not really clear what we could do at this point, right? Um, if there's a failure here because we've overrun our buffer, um, we can't really fix that. Um, or the way that we would need to fix that is to have a larger buffer size, and that it's already too late at this point. So there's not much that we could do here, but we may want to somehow communicate to our program that this, this happened. So what we might want to do is to kind of put a breakpoint inside here, or we could um, uh, jump to an error handler, and that way if we were debugging and this situation occurred, we could, uh, we could end up in that error handler. But the tricky thing there is that it's much more likely that you will end up in uh, an error handler while, uh, while you're debugging, because your program is kind of paused while the the real world, which is potentially sending you data, is not paused. So you can end up in a situation with simply by debugging that you actually uh, are more likely to overrun your buffer than you would be in a real world situation. So it's a bit tricky. We're not going to do anything about this now. We're going to leave this be. And then the next thing to handle is the UART read functions. So we're also kind of going to throw away all of this code. We don't really need that now. So the first thing to check is like, is the length that we are asking for, is that greater than zero? If it's not greater than zero, we cannot continue. We don't have anything to do. So we'll just return zero at that point. And otherwise, we're just going to try and read as many bytes as we can um, up into the length. So the way that we can do that is just to have a for loop um, We'll start with an index. It starts at one, uh, zero, sorry, and goes up until the length. And what we're going to try to do is to to read a byte of data into this buffer. So the way we do that is ring buffer read. So then we pass in a reference to our ring buffer, and we pass in a pointer to the byte which should be written. So the byte which should be written is just the the data like the the buffer that the user has passed to us so data at this particular index and then we need to pass a pointer to that so we take the address and then finally that's it 
but we need to see if this succeeded or not, right? Because if this did not succeed, as in, if we did, if we did not manage to read a byte because the buffer is empty at this point, uh, then we need to just uh, tell the the caller of this function like, hey, we were only able to read this many bytes. We didn't read the full length. We read, you know, half of it. Let's say. So how do we say how many bytes we read? <coughs> Well, actually, the number of bytes we've read is just this i variable. If you think about it, uh, kind of iterating through this, i is zero in the beginning, and we try to read a byte, but it's unsuccessful. So at this point, we need to return how many bytes we read, how many did we read? We read zero, so we read i. Now imagine that it works, so the first time around we read one. Uh, we read a byte successfully, so we jump back to the top, and again, we get here, and uh, we try to read, but it fails. So at that point, i is equal to one, and we read one byte. So you can see that, um, that i at this point is the number of bytes we read. So what we can do is to, um, let's see if the, the rename symbol will work here. Let's call this the number of bytes we read. And is this going to work correctly? You are read, yeah, this is what it wants to do. So let's apply that. It looks good. Yeah, kind of renaming variables in C is uh, trickier than in other languages because of complications in how to pass C code um, when you don't have access to the full context of the preprocessor, -pre uh, which is, is especially tricky, right? This is one of the reasons that the preprocessor in C is quite bad. But otherwise, we managed to escape this loop, which means we read all of the bytes that we could, and that means that we read all of the whole length. So that is the read function now complete. And the read byte, well, I'm just gonna make this um, nice and easy. I'm just gonna have a byte here, which is the, like a local variable. And then at the end, we're going to return whatever was in this local variable. And we're going to just call our own local UART read function. So we're going to read uh, into this byte and we're going to read a single byte. And basically we don't care if, um, if this read is successful or not because we've decided that when we do a read byte, it's the user's uh, responsibility to first check if there's data available. So this is how this works. And when you have a function that returns a value and you want to kind of, you want to uh, ignore that return value, a good practice in C is to just um, cast the result to void. And it's kind of a bit of a weird thing, but this is like a really clear indication that you didn't just forget to do something with this return value, like you're explicitly ignoring it. So this is kind of a convention you'll see sometimes in code bases. And I think it's quite good for documentation purposes. You do have to know that that's kind of the convention at play, but it is fairly common. So it's a maybe good thing to be aware of. Finally, data available. This one is now really straightforward, right? We have a function that tells us if our ring buffer is empty. And we want to know if our, basically, if our ring buffer is not empty. So we're just going to flip this condition. Okay, so now we have actually uh, rewritten the driver. And I think it's uh, much more robust. And we've basically solved both of our problems. Uh, we no longer have a concurrency issue or at least I don't think we do. <laughs> we no longer have um, an explicit concurrency bug, a race condition bug, which we had before, which is we don't know the order of execution of things and therefore we could get into a bad situation. Now, as long as our buffer is large enough, we should avoid that kind of situation. And uh, let's go back to our firmware, let's recompile um, and the nice thing about kind of changing the internals of a driver is that you don't actually have to change your main program, right? We didn't change the interface that we adhered to. Um, so we don't need to change any of this. Let's run this code. And of course, this is the same problem as always. And that is that we need to add the ring buffer to the make file. This is why it is quite nice to have um, a make file which automatically finds all of your source files, like it looks in a particular directory and generates all of these. But at the same time, it's also really good to know exactly what goes into your program. And you're really 
very being very specific about what goes into your program if you list these out. So I don't know, I'm in two minds about that. I think it's useful to do. So um, I'm gonna try again. It compiled and we should write that. We're running the program. Let's let the firmware run. So I'm gonna to switch to the terminal again, run screen. I press A and it seems that nothing happened. I press A again. Hmm, that's interesting. So I guess I've done something wrong. Let me just check on my wired connections here to make sure that there's no issue there. Okay, so this is actually really strange. I'm not quite sure what's gone on here, but um, yeah, so essentially what happened was a bunch of the code was seemingly being optimized out. Um, and I'm really not sure why. I think it might be this, co <laughs> this cast of void that's caused that. Um, so I should test that out. But basically, I've now replaced the call to UART read with a call to ring buffer read. And when I did this, um, it started working again. So I just want to get an understanding about if I don't explicitly cast this to void here, then I said that we're going to read uh, one byte. If I run this, then this is wrong because we shouldn't be passing a ring buffer here. We should be passing a data pointer, which is byte. Let's try this again. Run this. I'm going to put this back here. So I'm going to send A. Nothing. So in this case, for some reason, if I add UART read here, If I add UART read here, then the code is, um, no, oh, of course, this is the reason why, because this is a huge bug. This should be less than, or if it should, rather, it should be equal to zero. So if the length is zero, then we're going to return. This is, uh, wow, this is a really fun bug because it's actually uh, the compiler almost in an extremely unhelpful way, kind of telling me that this function was doing nothing. This is the reason that it's being optimized out. And I, I had seen this just now in the map file. So I went to check my map file. And if you check the map file and you try to look into the function ring buffer read, you see it's mentioned here. And if you scroll up to what this section is, this section is all of the stuff that got discarded. So this function, um, uh, you are sorry ring buffer read this got discarded and the reason that it got discarded is because the only path to calling this function was from another function whose only path to calling it would end up that it was going to be a no operation so the compiler just said all of this code is never going to run I can see that there's one path by which you'll get here and in that situation, you'll hit this if length greater than zero return zero. Therefore, don't do anything with it. I can just remove all the code, don't put it in the final binary and throw it all away. So this is this is great actually. So the void cast has no effect there. Let's run this again and just really check to make sure that this was the bug. So I'm going to come back here. I'm going to press A and we get B. That's excellent. <laughs> That's such a good bug. Okay, um, all right. So now we can actually see if this worked though, because as you can see, if I press a character, it still takes about a second for the character to come through, which means that we still have our one second of kind of fake work going on before we can read the bytes from our buffer. But now I'm going to press AB in quick succession. And what we get is the, uh, the output BC. And that's because we were able to buffer up those bytes in the meantime between this thing. So we've got A, B, C, D, E. Yeah, that actually worked. And then even at the end there, we got the F one second later. So yeah, this is, seems to be working uh, correctly. That's great.
All right, I did promise that um, I would mention how we can calculate uh, the size of a ring buffer, right? Like how large should we make our ring buffer? So let's just have a little think about this for a second. Um, uh, let's have node open just to do the calculation in. So our board rate is uh, 11, uh, 115, 200. So that's 115, 200 uh, bits per second. Um, those bits uh, actually include the meta bits around. So it's not actually the data. So the actual amount of bytes that we can take per second is actually uh, 11,520. This is how many bytes per second can come to the um, can end up uh, in in the the peripheral, right? So if we had um, let's say uh, we expected a delay of one second in our program, which we're currently doing, then in that case. Um, we'd need to have a buffer that was large enough to buffer up this many bytes that come in a second. So 11 kilobytes worth of data. Um, but you can imagine that if we didn't quite expect one, one full second of delay, which is quite a lot actually, uh, a huge amount of time in terms of like pausing execution in a single place. If we didn't expect that much time, like let's say we expected, I don't know, never more than 10 milliseconds of, of time. Well, what we could do is we could divide this by a thousand. That gives us the number of, um, like the number of mil, like bytes that we can, uh, the number of bytes that come per millisecond. So that's now 11.25. Um, that's the number of bytes that come per millisecond. And we take that 11.52, sorry. And we multiply it by say 10 milliseconds. And now we need a, bu uh, a buffer of around 115 uh, items. So we'd need to round that up to the nearest power of two, so 128, and that would give us our, our byte buffer for what we would expect. And I think that seems about reasonable. So let's actually change our, our item here uh, for maximum of around approximately 10 milliseconds of uh, yeah, uh, of like 10, 10 milliseconds of, I'm not sure what the word is here to, that we basically cannot like read from the buffer for. So uh, this, I don't know if latency is the correct word here, but basically this is our 10 milliseconds before we can uh, do an update. So this is how we can kind of calculate that. And of course that will change with uh, the board rate, that will change with um, everything else. But if you can now have some conception of like what that means in your program, 10 milliseconds of delay. Um, well, yeah, now you can actually have some confidence about this number making some sense. And of course we're doing bare metal programming. So we don't have any, like we just have sort of one big loop where multiple things are happening at the same time, not at the same time, they have to happen one after the other. And that means that we kind of need to be quite um, careful about how long we think any of those will take because they have to happen sequentially. And that means that the kind of cumulative time of all of those executions will impact this, this, this time, for example. Um, what can happen uh, in real time operating systems, which are kind of like uh, when you it's not like a full operating system, but it's a, a kind of reduced um, a reduced set of uh, primitives for th having things like tasks or threads. So you can have multiple kind of execution threads and you have a thread scheduler and the thread sc scheduler will intermittently switch from one, one uh, task to the next task. And that gives all of your programs uh, a, a little bit of time that they can execute for. And then you are able to, you're able to move your, um, uh, the, the ways in which you calculate this time gets a bit more complicated because now it's not just waiting for all of the tasks to complete, but rather you can sort of expect that your task is running at least once every however long and you know how long that individual task can take. But that is quite a complex subject and uh, it's not necessarily straightforward to see how that works.
you end up getting into uh, the, the pro problem with priorities, so which tasks have higher priority than others. So in most cases, your firmware will not have tasks that all run at the same time. Some tasks will be more important than others, and therefore they take more execution time. And it can become kind of hard to calculate when things will run and how long they'll take. So, you know, in, in our case, we've got a little bit of, uh, at least we can calculate our bounds, like our, our upper bound of how long we could take. But uh, again, in this program, that's never gonna really be a problem. Only when complexity increases will we see that. All right, that's kind of enough for today. Uh, I hope that this has been kind of insightful for you. I think um, finding these kind of data structures, I find data structures and algorithms to be kind of not that interesting when it's out of context. So a lot of people really love data structures and algorithms just for the, the, the fun of it. Um, I really get excited when I find a data structure or an algorithm that works really well in a context. And this kind of context of producer, consumer, and needing to um, uh, make sure that you have concurrency guarantees about uh, reading and writing, it's amazing that the ring buffer is a perfect, uh, perfect kind of candidate for that. And it's also interesting that, you know, we haven't spoken this whole time about other forms of concurrency management like uh, locks, kind of mutexes or semaphores. And that's because in this situation, they, they're not applicable. Um, you cannot really have the idea of a mutex when you have an interrupt handler, which is going to run and cannot run again, right? So if the inter interrupt handler comes up and it can't obtain this mutex, well, then it's not like it can wait there forever, right? Uh, it, it, it's not like we can come back and revisit that. It's either going to get stuck there or, uh, or um, yeah, or you're going to have to drop the byte. So it's not really a useful primitive in that case. Um, in any case, the ring buffer has solved our problem. In the coming videos, we're going to be looking at um, now building on top of our uh, UART uh, driver that we have with our ring buffer backed, uh, you know, ring buffer backing. And we're going to start building up a packet format. And what that's going to mean is that instead of just looking at individual bytes which are sent across the wire, we're going to start treating um, groups of bytes as a single packet. And we're going to be framing those bytes that come in into a, into a state machine that gathers up a fixed number of bytes into a packet. And then we can start asking questions about the validity of that packet. And the reason that we're going to do that is because UART is kind of an unreliable system, right? Um, it's possible and probable for interference to be picked up on the lines depending on the situation that you're in. And in the case of transferring a firmware image to a, a device, you really have to make sure that that firmware image is valid because if a single bit is flipped in that firmware image, that can actually have really devastating consequences, right? It can be, it can go all the way from the firmware just doesn't work from the moment that you plug it in um, to the firmware seems to work, but then fails in a really, really strange and unpredictable situation that you would never ever be able to tell. You would never find that bug because the code that you've compiled says that it works correctly, but because you flipped a bit, um, when that actually executes, a single instruction may, may be like, may go from branch if not equal to branch if equal. And of course your program then, we've already seen today what happens when you flip the logic of a single uh, if statement. So yeah, um, we really need to make sure that uh, the data that we transfer is legitimate and valid and what we intended to send. And if it was not, we need to be a way to recognize that and to re-request the data. And so that's kind of what we're going to explore in this upcoming few videos is like kind of the design of this packet format, how it's actually going to allow us to make certain guarantees and how we will build up a sort of little protocol around the packets such that if, um, if a packet contains invalid data or wasn't what was expected on the other side, that we can have a way to automatically respond from from either from the firmware or from the driver code that's going to you know implement the sending of the firmware, uh, such that um, such that we can re-request the packet or reject it or say that we accepted it. So I hope that sounds interesting to you. I find that this part is probably the the coolest part of the whole project. Uh, so really looking forward to that. 
I hope this has made sense. Please feel free to leave a comment down below or in the Discord server. I'm always happy to try my best to answer the questions that you may have related to the series. And uh, well, I just want to say thanks for watching. <laughs>